Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Shamanism has a long tradition on the Korean Peninsula and describes a set of ethnic religions and practices. It remains in practice to this day, yet shamanism and the role it plays in Korea have changed significantly over time. In particular, the pre-colonial and colonial era saw a drastic shift in the position it enjoyed within the Korean society. To learn more about shamanism during this period, we had the pleasure of interviewing Professor Merose Huang. She told us about the origins of the word shaman in Korea, the neo-Confucian critique of shamanism, the approach the Japanese colonial government adopted regarding shamans and how these performed colonial drag. Professor Mehoz Huang is Associate Professor of History at Hiram College. She wrote a dissertation on the coloniality of shamanism and has since then published various articles on the topic. Professor Huang received her PhD from the Department of East Asian Studies at the University of Toronto. Professor Mehoz Huang, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you very much for having me. Your academic interests lie in the history of print media discourse on shamanism. How did you become interested in this topic? Uh, well, I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Colorado Boulder. There, uh, the University of Colorado Boulder has one of the largest Native American research institutes that have now has now been changed into an actual doctoral program. Uh, but when I was there, there was a real strong body of Native American scholars and scholars working on Native American scholarship. And so uh, I was initially interested in religious studies because my mother is a Presbyterian missionary. And so um, when I went into the major, I found that there were a number of people working on Native American shamanism. And so I studied with those professors like Professor Sam Gill, Lynn Ross uh, Bryant, and um, the infamous Ward Churchill. And became intensely interested in Native American shamanism. But then when I was a senior in, in my undergraduate um, program, I was writing a senior thesis on uh, comparative shamanisms through uh, the Americas when a classmate of mine showed me a, a copy of The Shaman's Drum, which is a publication that's since been out of print. In this copy that he showed me, there was a story about a Korean American woman who was um, had fallen into a very mysterious illness at a young age and she grew increasingly ill over her teenage years went to a, a whole slew of different types of medical practitioners to try to um, cure her and was not able to uh, be cured uh, until finally when she was in her early 20s somebody recommended that she go to korea to pursue some traditional health um, practices in Korea. So she flew there with her parents and um, after going to um, you know, uh, Chinese medicine doctors and a few others, um, she, somebody had recommended that she go visit a shaman. And when she did, the shaman was able to assess that she was actually falling into a spiritual uh, illness um, and that she must um, go um, find out who her spiritual guide is. So she fell into a trance and she uh, went to the mountains, spent three days there, uncovered these articles, these religious art artifacts that uh, identified the spiritual guide that was calling her. And the spirit, the shaman mother then, uh, when she returned to the village, was able to then help her with her initiation. And this woman became uh, a Korean American shaman uh, practicing in the United States. Well, when I read this story, I was really blown away. I had no idea up to that point that a thing called Korean shamanism even existed. Um, and I, my direction and my interests uh, churn, churned at that point, and I decided I was going to pursue that as kind of my, my life's goal. Today's interview will focus on how different actors discussed shamanism on the Korean peninsula. Before going any further, though, could you give us a brief description of shamans and shamanism? Sure. Some argue that there's no singular definition of shamans or shamanism. Uh, commonly accepted assumptions are that shamanism is an ancient indigenous religion similar to animism, that shamans are people who specialize in conducting sacred rituals based on these ancient spiritual practices. In Korea, the most common understanding of shamanism is that it's a female-dominant 
spiritual practice in which a ritual specialist will communicate with the dead in the interest of their descendants and others among the living. But you have to keep in mind when you're using that definition that it applies um, mostly in the Korean case, but it certainly is not a definition that can be applied in other places where we have found shamanism. Though the word is used in Korea, shamanism is not actually originating from the peninsula. Where does it come from and why should we actually care about the origins of this word? I'll start with your first question, where did the word originate? Um, on that question, the jury is still out. So there's evidence to suggest that the word could have originated from Sib Siberian Evenki, word called Saman, and that a Russian migrant to Siberia was the first to record the word based on his interactions with Tungusic people in the late 17th century. Um, adding to this debate, though, are theories that the word might have originated from Finland, and then there's yet even other ideas that the that the word could have originated in India, some believing that it may have originated actually in China. Um, but the jury really is still out on that. There is no definitive answer for that. Um, and then why should we care about the origins of this word? Well, questioning the origins gets us to ask other questions like, how can shamanism be imported and indigenous to a region at the same time? Or, if the word was artificially created by someone writing it down, then what does the actual thing that was happening on the ground, what was that, and what, what can we call it? Um, another question you could ask is, if the word originated in a particular place and time, how and why did it spread around the world? Well, to these questions, I don't have answers to all of them, but I can start to formulate a historiography based on some of them. So I build off the idea that the word originated in Siberia in the 17th century, and then try to identify when and how the word was used to discover indigenous practices in other places around the world. When we examine the first writings of, say, African shamanism, Australian shamanism, Native American shamanism, we find some common threads. These were written by Germans, British, French missionaries, and other Western imperial advisors, these people were using the word shamanism to define the indigenous spiritual practices that they supposedly witnessed. Uh, and here I say supposedly because much of the early writings on shamanism were done by armchair researchers who actually never stepped foot in the region that they were writing about. Um, so we could conclude that from this that the word shamanism became a part of the taxonomy of Western imperial expansion to document, record, and ultimately regulate the practices of the people in the imperial frontier. Is it fair to say that discussions of shamanism then in the West fell and maybe still fall under, generally speaking, orientalist practices? Um, certainly if we're looking at um, the ideas of, say, Edward Said on Orientalism, that there is that element in, in our understanding of shamanism, that shamanism is a way for us to understand the other vis-a-vis -vis the empire, um, and that those regions are orientalized in a way that show that they have these um, archaic um, connections and that they are not as progressive or as um, have the qualities of a modern state um, like the West and that the West is, you know, people of Western um, academies are actually the ones producing the knowledge on these regions. Um, to some extent that that is true, um, but one of the things I like to argue in my research is that it wasn't entirely the case. So that's only part of the story. In the Korean case, we see a very long tradition of indigenous writing on shamans. And so what do we do with that when we then come uh, into contact with this new idea of shamanism that then is correlated to the indigenous study of the same subject? Um, so the argument that I make is that the writings of the other was actually done internally by elite intellectuals who were trying to figure out a way to assess the commoner population. Um, and there was a process of othering that happened domestically, internally, in a way that's not really understood just by using the concepts of Orientalism.
As we discussed, the word shaman was mostly used in the West. What word did the Korean elites actually use to discuss individuals practicing rituals? Well, the word that um, we assume that there's a local co- Korean equivalent to the term, that that was something that was a naturally made uh, correlation. Uh, but the term that Westerners most associated with that is that is tied to shamanism, the word the foreign word shaman is mudang. Um, so if we can then use mudang to assume that the local co- Korean equivalent to shaman is that word, then we could answer that there were in fact extensive involved discussions of them in the 19th century. These discussions uh, also included other subjects, however, but they were all revolving around a root uh, character known as Mu, which is Wu in Chinese, but Mu. So there was a variations of Mu that were used um, simultaneously, like Mu Dang, Mu Gyok, Mu Nyo, Mu In, and so forth. All of these writings about these people that were related to Mu existed in the earliest literature in Korea, dating as far back as the 13th century with the first publications. These involved records of shaman kings and their court rituals and shamanic advisors to the court. The discussions on Mu became more prolific in the midst Joseon dynasty when Neo-Confucian ritual debates abound and literati became increasingly interested in defining forms of Neo-Confucian heterodoxy. And Mudang involvement in improper ritual was also a big issue for these Neo-Confucianists. They also proliferated in the miscellany essays of the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, In these essays, scholars were interested in the intellectual concerns of their day and topics related to practical social reform. So in these essays, they included discussions about everyday life, common customs, and folklore, of which then Mudang became a very essential part. So to give maybe some practical examples, how were Mudang discussed by those Neo-Confucianist um, scholars? They were described um, mostly in the sense, well, of two. there were two t- different strains of discussions around Mu. One of them was that these people were um, evading taxes. And so a big concern among these Neo-Confucian reformers was that they needed to be able to centralize and more systemat- better systematize ways of collecting taxes from the common folk. And recognizing that Mu uh, were able to kind of fly under the radar of household registries, but while being primary income earners for their households, they were trying to figure out a way to capture that that revenue from that population. So there was a lot of discussion around that. Another common discussion um, in this, uh, what we call the shilhak, the practical learning um, scholars uh, essays, was that mu uh, were conducting improper ritual, as I mentioned earlier. And the reason that umsa, improper ritual, is so important was because these Neo-Confucianists were trying to figure out a way to reduce the amount of heterodoxic ritual practices among the commoner population. And one of the reasons for that was to subscribe to a new kind of Neo-Confucian social ethics that then needed to be applied to the commoner population. So this move then to kind of create an ethical social reform among the Korean population was something that was relatively new, but then Mudang were also a very important part of that formula. In the 19th century, the West becomes an increasingly more important player on the Korean peninsula. But before going there, were there any recent developments in Korean discourses on Mudang that are worth mentioning? Um, not directly related to Mudang, but there were certain uh, political situations that I think um, put context to the later discussions on Mudang that emerged in the later 19th century. So in the mid-19th century, uh, it was a very tumultuous time in Korea. We have a number of famines, uh, natural disasters, um, that also is compounded by uh, a, a observation that the Chinese Empire, the Middle Kingdom, is crumbling. And so the, the notion that China may be an unstable neighbor, 
and that Koreans need to devel develop forms of self-strengthening really begin to emerge at that time. And so we have um, a belief that the Korean uh, population is in a state of chaos. And so there are millenarian r religious uh, visionaries that are emerging at this time. The one that we are probably most familiar with in Korean studies is the Tonghak movement. So the founder of the Tonghak is actually emerging at this time, which is not a coincidence. It's happening because there are peasant revolts, there are there's mass f massive famines and uh, starvation um, that is uh, crippling the country and also causing great strains to the Korean court. And so this kind of chaos then is, is a way to set up the arguments about how to then bring social order back into the country. Korea is forced to enter unequal treaties in the 1870s, but before that there were already some Westerners present in the Korean Peninsula. Who were they and how did this contact matter when we are talking about Mudang? The largest population of foreigners in Korea prior to the 1870s were French, uh, French Jesuit missionaries and uh, their followers. And so we have some converts that are actually also in Korea uh, from China, and there are records um, in the Vatican on the Catholic Church uh, to support that evidence. And so there are those populations that um, are, are are living in Korea uh, clandestinely because there were already by the mid 1800s um, the first uh, anti-Catholic uh, laws put into place. Did these missionaries have any contact with the Shemen and Mudang populations? I would say probably they did, but there is no documentary evidence to that effect. Um, the first written uh, record of a missionary contact with Mudang happens in 1874 uh, through a volume, very extensive two-volume account uh, known as the History of the Church of Korea, published by a Claude Chaudalet, a French Jesuit missionary who spent um, his foreign missionary years in India, and he had some advisors who were translating and smuggling materials out of Korea in order for him to compile his volumes on Korea in 1874. Could you share with us any examples of how these early Westerners on the peninsula actually perceived uh, Mudang? The, uh, so in Dalai's account, uh, most of his writing was based on these letters and transactions that were smuggled out of the country. Um, his account of Mudang uh, was really couched within the bigger project for the Vatican and the French Catholic Church, which was to account for the anti-Catholic persecutions that were happening in Korea. As we know, Korea uh, has, in world history, the largest number of Catholic uh, martyrs in the world. And so that was happening at the time that Dalé was making this inquiry. And so um, one of the interesting things to note here was that Dal Dalé's account of Korean Mudang was a way to talk about how Korean religious practices were invalid. And so they were, in his mind, uh, essentially Chinese and there was nothing really distinctive about Korean practices. And that included shamans, and, or what he called uh, mudang, uh, they spelled it M-O-O-T-A-N-G, um, in an assessment that I'd imagine um, Koreans would have challenged. But there's also a second actor who comes in a little while later. She is Isabella Bird, a British med medical missionary who traveled extensively around the world and who visited Korea up to four times. She writes a book called Korea and Her Neighbors, and that's published in 1897. In that account, she gives exacting detail of her interactions with commoners and heads of state in the mid-1890s. She wrote much more extensively on Mudang than did Dalé, uh, who Dalé never uses the word shamanism, although the word shamanism is actually in circulation, uh, limited circulation in French publications. Bird, on the other hand, freely uses the word to describe what she sees on site in Korea. Like Dalé, she didn't credit her local informants and presented herself as a sole producer of relevant information on Korea. But she went so far as to introduce her own work by describing Dalé's publication as, quote, obsolete. 
So that was one of the things that she was saying is that I, she was going into the country to present new information, more useful information than did Dalé. Did these individuals know about the neo Confucianist discussions on Mudang? And if so, did that actually influence their understanding of what was happening on the peninsula? Although there is no, no direct evidence to prove that, and it's somewhat circumstantial, I say that it would have been impossible for these, uh, the French and the British to write about Mudang with as much detail as they did without having resorted to indigenous sources. And so although both those writers did not know classical Chinese and so could not have read the earlier Neo-Confucian essays on Mudang, they certainly must have had uh, local aides. So those aides would have been informants, translators, uh, scholars, people who might have been um, sympathetic to the, the Catholic movement and then the later Protestant movement in Korea and participated in those missionary efforts. Um, but they must have had these people because they do things like describe the names of the articles that they use in the rituals. Um, they, they talk about the kinds of uh, tax incentives that have impacted the mudang. Um, and these types of information that you would only be able to get if you had uh, some access to local scholarship on those, those subject matters. The end of the 19th century also saw the emergence of early Korean newspaper. How did journalists discuss mudang and was it something new or was it just a rehash of the neo-confucianist critique on mudang no i think it was somewhat different uh so uh like i said isabella bird was in korea um in the late end of the 19th century this time was a very crucial time in korea because the first korean newspapers began printing at the last decade of the 19th century in 1896 the independent newspaper, Dongnip Shimun, produced an English-Korean bilingual daily that would have been indispensable for foreigners like Bird. This privately run newspaper, started by revolutionary reformers of the Independence Club, like Seo Jae Pil, who we know in, with the English name Philip Jason, uh, then also with Yun Chi Ho, and then a couple other American um, missionaries. These people were adamant about maintaining Korea's national sovereignty in the immediate aftermath of the Sino-Japanese War that happened in 18, to be concluded in 1895. These journalists printed regular scathing reports and editorials that blamed Mudang and other members of society that they thought were too traditional and who they believed kept the nation from strengthening. Then in 1904, on the eve of the Russo-Japanese War, a British man by the name of Ernest Bethel founded the Korea Daily News, the Tehan Mei Shimbo, with a Korean independence activist, Yang Gi Tak. This was also a bilingual publication. So unlike the earlier journalists, these writers wrote much more directly to resist Japan's intent to take over Korea. Um, and Bethel dies in 1909, and the paper is immediately taken over by the new Japanese colonial government in 1910 under a shortened name, Daily News, Meiju Shimbo. But what's, what's so interesting about Bethel and Yang's columns in the Korea Daily News is that they used Mudang to highlight political corruption and to identify those who were conspiring with the Japanese. So this negative discourse on Mudang made them made Mudang Japanese, not Korean, in order for the writers to characterize the Japanese as barbarous, backward, criminal, etc., and to get the population to resist Japan. But an important distinction to note is that these early Korean newspapers never used the word shamanism to describe Mudang or shamans. They never used that word, although the foreign word was in publication at this time elsewhere. This makes me think that those types of foreign words serve little purpose for these newspaper journalists because they're mainly interested in using mudang to discuss their local agendas for social reform and national sovereignty. In 1905, Korea is forced to become a Japanese protectorate and is eventually annexed five years later. Colonial rule on the peninsula is frequently divided in three eras, 1905-1905, 
military rule until 1920, then cultural rule, and finally mass mobilization for war starting in the mid-1930s. Going in chronological order, what was the Japanese opinion of Mudang during this first era of military rule? The Japanese took over Korea's legal and judicial autonomy and then shut down Korean-owned presses from 1910 to 1920, which uh, we describe today as the military rule period. While most people assume that they oppressed shamanism and other forms of cultural expression as well at this time, I haven't been able to find evidence to solidly support that idea. And in fact, uh, it appears that cultural experts were brought from the Japanese colonial administration in Taiwan. They started there in 1895. And then in 1905, they're brought into this new colony of Korea to study shamans as a means of understanding Korean culture. I believe that Japanese settlers in Korea sometimes solicited mukut, which is uh, mudang-based uh, rituals, ritual services, just like some of the Koreans uh, worshipped at Shinto shrines long before the 1930s state Shinto and cultural assimilation laws were instated. So the early colonial administration's position on mudang was that they were part of Korean custom and folklore and should be better understood as a way to effectively ma manage and control this new colonial population alongside keeping tabs on the settler communica uh, community. Before the March 1st independence movement of 1919, so marking the end of the military rule period, um, and my conclusion would be that Mudang posed very little threat to the colonial government. Were these Japanese experts on folklore brought from Taiwan influenced by prior Korean debates on Mudang? Or were they rather influenced by Western debates? Or was it just their own research that motivated their inquiry? The earliest Japanese scholars on shamans, on Taiwanese shamanism, um, those people were actually, I, I don't know, kind of bootleg anthropologists, if you will. Although the, the concept of anthropology uh, emerges as folklore studies. Um, and their kind of um, off-the-cuff kind of training that happened in Taiwan um, was loosely based on their understanding of British social anthropology. So um, Edward Burnett Tyler, he's a really important person to um, help us understand the early formations of uh, social cultural anthropology in Britain and people like that and Edward Morse um, working in the United States um, these scholars uh, presented for the Japanese a new way of understanding uh, indigenous populations through shamanism and so they were very much impacted by that kind of scholarship in Taiwan and then bring that scholarship and that intellectual pedigree into Korea once Korea becomes colonized. Is it fair to say that the colonial government had a live and let live approach to Korean shamanism, or did it actually take any step to try to oppress it? During the uh, pre-colonial period, I would say that in the latter half of the Joseon dynasty, they were very skeptical of shamanic practices or what we call mugut, the uh, mudang-based rituals, shamanic rituals, uh, very skeptical of that. Uh, while that is said, there are people like uh, uh, Kyungmun Hwang who argue that the there was kind of economic incentive for the colonial for the Joseon government to allow shamans to to continue with their work um, because they also provided a certain amount of tax revenue for the Joseon government. And so in a way, it was kind of a on, on the ground, a live and let live kind of practice. But on paper, in terms of Neo-Confucian policies, they were supposed to be uh, kind of corruptible sources in society. Um, so kind of a contradiction there. During the colonial period, um, there was much less ambiguity in terms of the ways in which Koreans saw uh, shamans in their society, and they there was almost a unilateral feeling that shamans needed to be eliminated. Was this view shared by the Japanese colonial government? To a limited extent, but it was mostly to appease the Koreans. Um, they did not see that the efforts put into mudang eradication uh, were going to be that worthwhile. 
And whereas the Korean population, the intellectual population that were publishing against Mudang were adamant that they needed to be eliminated. And so the strongest opposition came from the Korean population during the colonial period. As mentioned previously, in the 1920s, Japan decides to replace military rule with cultural rule. What motivated this change and did this new flavor of imperialism behave differently towards Mudang? As some scholars of the 1920s have argued, cultural rule implied a softening of earlier militaristic colonization. One indication of this was that the previous ban on Korean-owned presses was lifted at this time, and then there was an explosion of Korean publications in the 1920s. But at the same time that these printing presses started to run, publication censorship laws were also drastically expanded starting in the 1920s to indicate then that colonial control measures appeared less direct but actually had more penetrating effects during this cultural rule period. So in a way, culture was a softer form of rule. Um, Thinking about it in that way is a misnomer because it actually represents the government general's investment in Korean culture. In the 1920s, Korean scholars were commissioned to research ancient Korean history, and through that commission, some of them explored Korean shamanism as a new scholarly subject. Now, what's interesting about this is that once Mudang became an academic subject, these ritual specialists were taken more seriously, and we see artists, poets, scholars, all of these intellectuals romanticizing Mudang in a way that had never been done before. Two of these men commissioned by the Japanese government were Chui Nam Song and Yi Nung Hwa. They were tasked to participate in a massive archival project on Korean history. In 1927, the two men co-authored a treatise on Korean shamanism that frames Korean history through the lens of shamanism, which depicted surely Koreans as backward and unable to govern themselves. Yet, you argue that there is more to this than meets the eye. Yes, Chen and Yi were essentially arguing against the Japanese assimilation argument. They set out to prove that Koreans were not related to the Japanese and were instead related to mainland Asian communities like Manchurians and Siberians. So they're actually referring back to some of the earliest scholarship that we see on shamans from the, that Siberian, um, central Siberian region. They use specific aspects of Korean shamanism to prove this point. One particular point stands out as an idiosyncrasy that Koreans shared with Siberians as far as Che and Yi were concerned. They believe that the history of a history of transgendered practices indicate this, uh, this original um, shamanic practice. They argue that communities in both regions, in Korea and in parts of Siberia, were originally masculine that they were, the traditions were masculine, uh, but that both of these uh, regions, we see a parallel transition to their societies, their shamanic societies becoming feminized. Male shamans, uh, quote, change their sex, as, as Chen Nam Sun put it, through shamanic ceremonies, and then in the Korean case, the shamanic tradition was later dominated by women. And so this is how he reasons that Uh, the shamanic tradition in Korea is distinctly feminine. Uh, Using this argument of transgender shamans then, Che and Yi were able to argue that Koreans shared ethnic origins with Siberia and then flip the logic on its head that Japan and Korea shared ethnic origins. Che and Yi have a fairly controversial argument. How was that received by the Japanese colonial government at the time? Uh, they continue to work for the the uh, colonial government, especially Yi Neng Hua. Chen Nam Sun um, gets into more trouble with the colonial government um, and even lands up in jail for a while. But uh, Yi Neng Hua um, had a long career with the colonial government and the uh, Korean history, ancient Korean history compilation committee, and then elsewhere. And he publishes quite a bit on Korean culture. Um, and so they weren't necessarily. Um, directly opposed to these publications, as far as we know, um, not in the na- late 1920s when they came, when this publication came out. But I think that as more scholarship on Korean studies started to emerge, showing Korea's independent development and and 
distinctly different ethnic origins, as those arguments were being pushed further and further in the, into the early 1930s, then we see uh, contrastive scholarship being spearheaded by the Japanese scholars. And so that might have been uh, a reaction to these earlier scholarships. So how did the colonial government actually behave towards Mudang during the colonial rule period? During the cultural rule period? Um, the colonial government allowed for Korean scholars to explore uh, Korea's antiquity. And so shamans fell into that category of antiquity studies. And um, they were also used to describe a uh, new area, a very exciting research that emerged in the 1920s on Chilla. The Chilla dynastic era was an era that uh, scholars were very excited about in the 1920s. And so from here we see the emergence of a new historiography that say to say that uh, the earliest Korean kings were actually shamanic kings. And so shamans are treated in Korea as a kind of primordial religious slash political um, entity and um, embraced by the Korean schol scholastic population as a, a source of pride and national and ethnic consciousness. How did the Korean public react to this, and especially the Korean newspapers? When it came to things that were couched as Korean history or Korea's antiquity um, and uh, cultural heritage, they were quite favorable to that and thought that it had a place in Korean um, indigenous pedagogy. And so as uh, the newspapers were primarily interested in a um, in creating literacy, uh, mass literacy, and promoting public education projects, they were also interested in trying to incorporate those types of elements of Korean shamanism into the new curriculum. Uh, again, on Korean antiquity, Korean Shilla history, etc. In 1920, a certain number of Mudang are allowed to form a guild, the Spirit Worshipper Guild. Could you tell us more about the context in which that happened and why it was actually formed? The guild, the Spirit Worshippers Guild, known as the Sungshin in Johap, uh, were actually a cultural labor guild, and so they were recognized as, as an occupational guild that fit under a new vision of cultural work or cu cultural occupation um, in the 1920s. And the arguments that the newspapers make is that this guild was actually founded by this man, Kim Tae-ik, who they say was a Japanese settler posing or disguising himself as a Korean man. And um, whether that he was disguising himself or he just decided to um, become Korean, I, we can't say, but he did help uh, petition the government to form this guild, and um, there is a good chance that the uh, the kinds of accusations the newspapers were making was true in that he had strong connections to the colonial government and to high officials, and that was one of the ways in which he was able to successfully um, pass the uh, licensure for this guild. Um, but anyway, the guild was founded in 1920 and uh, right at the beginning of the cultural rule uh, banner, the, this, new, this new era of administration. And so the newspapers were really up in arms about it, saying that they believed that this was a sign that Japan was going to make Korea become more backwards and that they're failing on their promise to modernize the, the country. Um, uh, for the guild, uh, they were, as far as I can tell, incredibly popular uh, amongst not just the Korean population, but with the Japanese settler population. And so there were people of all sorts that were actually going to their shows, that were attending their workshops and their classes and, and concerts, and even uh, participating in some of their philanthropic uh, endeavors. And uh, so that was happening in the 1920s. In practice, was there any difference with those newly minted official mudang, so to speak, and the uh, lay mudang, those who are still in the countryside or those who are not actually participating in the guild's activities? Yeah, in my mind, the biggest difference was that these new uh, Sungshin in Chohap members 
uh, the ones who were actually the teachers and the um, experts leading the school and training programs for this, the Chohap, they were very different than what we might have seen in the countryside uh, of Mudang or you know other Sesemmu or people who were practicing various forms of shamanic practice throughout the, the Korean countryside. Um, the main differences I think were, or the biggest differences that appear to me are that the Sungshinin Johab was very avant-garde. And so they were very much interested in, perf- in doing things like new forms of plays and participating in new kinds of dances uh, that were uh, very experimental, but also in line with some of the avant-garde um, artistic movements that were happening in other places around the world. And so they're very globally minded, incredibly cosmopolitan, and artistically refined in a way that also drew in a wider uh, international audience. You describe the shamans of this period of cultural rule as conspicuous indigenes. What do you mean by that? Conspicuous indigens, actually, I love that question because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's something that helps me to really uh, figure out what's happening at this time. The word conspicuous indigens really comes from this idea, I think, that um, the term describes some, kind of, some of the struggles that Korean nationalists um, must have been having with the colonial cultural project. So on the one hand, they appreciated the distinctions in Korean culture. So, you know, involving the uh, shamans in the parts of Korean antiquity, etc., as I mentioned before. So they, there's that appreciation. Uh, but at the same time, you know, that Korea needed to be distinct to argue that the, the country was an independent nation, not just a Japanese territory. Um, nationalists were also working very hard to, to you know, do things like increasing Korean liter- literacy, Korean language, to push for an indigenous curriculum. So there was that. But while that was happening, Korean culture, in a lot of these reformers' minds, um, has the danger of becoming too distinct. So Koreans should not appear overly different, overly out of sync, or too far behind the times that they can't catch up. And that social reform and modernization would be something that's in an impossible future for them. Um, so you see the struggle with some of the new icons of Korean culture, like Korean shamans. These people posed a certain amount of danger to the Korean nationalist project because they were seen as too conspicuous, as too traditional or too indigenous, the opposite of the modern Korean project. And so they were really conflicted about that. To simplify... The Japanese government tried to assimilate Koreanness into the Japanese empire, while Koreans were trying to use shamanism to make themselves different from its colonial overlord. But what about Mudang themselves? How did they position themselves through their practice? So to understand this a little bit, I think we need to think about the religion debate that was um, also going on throughout the colonial period. so just a quick mention that during the Meiji Restoration, when the, the Meiji Reform began, um, the earliest religion policies were written in the 1860s, and then the Japanese continually uh, reformed those policies and revised them based on their needs, uh, primarily to centralize their administration over Buddhist churches and Shinto shrines, and then also later in, to incorporate the regulation over folk shrines. Um, In the Korean colony, these imperial religion policies were revisited as the empire challenged foreign Christian involvement in the Korean independence movement. Um, So they were hesitating to oust Western foreign missions outright because they knew that would get them in trouble with a lot of these Western nations, but they wanted to provide certain protections over Japanese Shinto uh, and the Japanese Buddhist orders that were also very big in Korea. Um, And they were creating this hierarchy of religions in their policies and granting certain privileges based on where that religious order or church fit into that hierarchy. So that context then, for the Korean religious churches and orders, created a really interesting environment where the religious orders started to publish on their church to advocate for their church. And the debate really revolved around a certain kind of rhetorical tropes to, uh, as a like, public 
petition that the their religion or their church was the true church um, or that their religion was logical or moral or ethical and scientific etc what's different about the shamanic order was that there was no church there was no congregation or clergy or um, any kind of easily encapsulated organization for them to really mobilize around the ideas around you know the tenets of shamanism say um, and they didn't have a publication so there was no mouthpiece for the shamans to uh, rally themselves around they were the silent contenders in this debate um, they didn't document their practices or represent their traditions in writing um, in the ways that these other churches did what they did have was this cultural labor organization uh, established through the cultural rule initiative and evidence suggests that um, that that was a very useful way for them to then ha participate in this um, in the kind of hierarchy and then later um, as a result of their their guild licensure they were also um, very important to the formation of state Shinto and so that was one of the big criticisms that was made in the newspapers they participate in state Shinto the Korean papers believe that uh, they were uh, very instrumental to the Japanese project of assimilation while my argument is that the Koreans uh, shaman groups and populations saw themselves as en not any more loyal to the Japanese colonial assimilationist projects than they were to the the Korean neo-confucian um, uh, oppression of shamans and so um, it was more a rather I think a form of survival uh, that they participated in some of these new campaigns um, than it was a form of, of co-optation and uh, collaboration you have described Sung Shimin's activities as colonial drag. What do you mean by that? The best way to get a sense of what colonial or colonial drag is is when the shamans, the Sung Shin and Johab, were participating in in attending and worshiping at the Shinto shrines. This was actually happening at a time before state Shinto policies were instated. And so they were doing this voluntarily. And uh, some people argue that the colonial government wasn't entirely supportive of that. They didn't want uh, Koreans becoming uh, Shinto. The, they were actually in the 1920s uh, really conflicted about whether or not that, uh, what level Koreans should assimilate and wanted to protect the, uh, the, the Japanese settler population more than anything. Um, so the, the Korean participation in Shinto was, the, uh, I think, a way for Koreans to see what elements of universal spiritual practice existed in local forms. And so going to the Shinto shrine, there were aspects of that kind of worship that resonated with the Korean shaman population. And they really utilized that uh, to expand their membership and support and worship. Um, but also at the same time, I think that they're very cognizant about how to be politically savvy at a time when they were there was a foreign rule in their country. And so probably they knew that it was not going to hurt them and if anything it would help them to do things that really showed their respect and veneration of Japanese folk customs um, and in that way I think you know to kind of be talking out of both sides of their mouth in on the one time trying to represent this very uh, essence of Koreanness and then at the same time do things that were very J Japanese is what I'm calling colonial drag. In the 1930s, mobilizing resources to support the Japanese war efforts became paramount for the colonial government. How did this affect the government's approach to shamanism and are there any developments uh, in the field of shamanistic studies, so to speak? The most important thing that happens in terms of Korean shamanism in the 1930s is a publication by uh, a scholar by the name of uh, Akiba um, Takashi and his partner Akamatsu Chijo. These scholars produced a 
a uh, series of works on Korean shamanism starting in 1932. And so Akiba becomes the head of the sociology department at Keijo uh, Imperial University, which is later known as uh, Seoul National University. And uh, he creates a whole um, a legacy of descendants, of intellectual descendants working around Korean shamanism. And what he does is he brings in a new form of ethnographic and ethnological research methods into Korea. So where the previous uh, scholarship by Yi Neunghwa, Chen Nam San and the like were looking at exploring Korean shamanism as an idea or you know, as a historiographical idea or as an artistic a cultural idea, Akiba and Akamatsu were invested in trying to figure out what those traditions were in the field and what they observed. And so participant observation methods uh, become the standard form of, of scholastic practice when it comes to shamanism because of those two scholars. Um, and that emerges in 1932. Since Japan is expanding its war effort, one could assume that all resources are devoted only to the war effort. Does that mean that cultural assimilation was just simply not on the menu anymore and everything was focused on providing more resources for the war effort? Uh, no, it was actually the opposite. So um, under this new era, era of war mobilization, um, we have the assimilationist policies really take effect. And so the name change order, the Shinto shrine um, participations throughout the empire, actually, uh, Japan really uh, puts a heavy hand on the ways that people are supposed to practice Shinto. Um, and people even in the metropole are up in arms about it. Um, and so there are those types of um, pressures to kind of signal that this is a new era of fascism. Um, and one of the things that we have to keep uh, be aware of is that during the 1930s, uh, when Korea, or I'm sorry, when Japan was being um, uh, overrun by this this kind of new Pacific theater of war, they were also very much invested in cultural projects. And so, uh, where Akiba and Akamatsu's work uh, was an indication, there was actually an ongoing and perhaps expansion of shamanic research projects uh, in the 1930s. And so if you look through the, the bibliographies of these scholars and ethnographers on Korea, whether they're Japanese or Korean, most of their publications come out in the 1930s and into the 1940s. To conclude, what were the consequences of the colonial period for shamanism after Japan actually left the peninsula? Did those transcribe to post-war discourses? Korean and Japanese scholars from the colonial period, they paved the academic arena for later shamanism studies. And so after the 1945 liberation, we see Korean anthropologists and other cultural studies scholars relying on colonial materials to help formulate their own understanding of their field fieldwork observations. Shamanism becomes an important part of the divided nation building project, perhaps more so in South Korea than in the North, but some scholars argue that even in the North, shamanic elements in the origin myth stories of the North propagate a, and they're propagated and indicating a strong indication of the North's recognition of its shamanic heritage. And in the South, the, we see an ongoing endeavor uh, with collaborations with American ethnographers and cultural anthropologists to do fieldwork on shamanism uh, throughout Korea and interestingly the Jeju project uh, where we're looking at shamanism in Jeju Island as a very distinctive part of Korea's um, ancestry uh, that becomes a highlight of the post-war research. Professor Huang, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. This was a real pleasure. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website koreaandtheworld.org Subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.